This is Women's Tech Radio, a show on the Jupiter Broadcasting Network, interviewing interesting women in technology, exploring their roles and how they're successful in technology careers. I'm Paige. And I'm Angela. Today, we're interviewing Jo. She's the co-founder of Cardsmith.co, and she goes into the awesome platform that Cardsmith provides for people who are trying to get things organized instead of using sticky notes all over their monitors. <laughs> and before we get into the interview, I want to mention that you can support Women's Tech Radio on the Jupiter Broadcasting Network by going to patreon.com forward slash today. And we get started by asking Jo what she's up to in technology today. I am a co-founder at Cardsmith, cardsmith.co, and we are taking the best of sticky notes and melding it with the digital world to create an awesome experience for people who want to make their great ideas happen. So... There's two of us. Um, Monica, my co-founder, is the CEO. I am officially the chief creative officer, which means I'm in charge of user and brand experience. Uh, For example, it's my responsibility to make Cardsmith as easy and awesome to use as possible. It's also my responsibility to make sure that people understand on the marketing site why Cardsmith is going to make them awesome. And as in the case of a bootstrap startup, there's a lot more that I end up doing too, of course. Always. Yes. 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 Um, so, and, and it's interesting with um, being part of a tech startup, I'll be honest, I'm not a techie, but I think that that's good. I'm not necessarily a Luddite, but I'm someone that's, um, you might even say I'm skeptical, but like I don't buy things or incorporate things into my life just because they're new and cutting edge. I really bring things into my life because I think they're going to make me better. So, so my goal with tech is to make it more human. So that's how I've landed here. And, and it's really quite a great challenge. That's, that's a, I mean, that's a great story. That's part of what I love about tech is that it, there's room for everybody, really, mm-hmm. in, in a lot mm-hmm. of things. But I feel like you finished there with a really great thing. Like, you're the, you want tech to be more human. What does that mean to you? Well, you know what? Like, here's the deal. Like, there's a lot of people that... And I think this is decreasing to a certain extent, but like if someone doesn't understand how to use Cardsmith, it's my problem. It's my, it's like, they shouldn't have to mold to tech. Tech should mold to them. And I think we are getting to that point where people are demanding that. But like, if you look at, at, at websites and apps from a long time ago, or even not that long ago, it, it asked a lot of, of the person. And, you know, people still today think it's their fault if they can't figure something out. So I think that's at the core of what motivates me. And I also think one of the things that motivates me, it's like, it's not about tech. It's about making humans experience better, right? Like we don't just make these cool things because they're new. We make them because there's a purpose and there's a meaning behind them. And, and it's a lot of work. It's not easy, but like, that's what really motivates me. Yeah. I like that. I, and I think you're totally, totally on point. I think that we are moving from a world where we were as users expected to mold ourselves around uncomfortable technology. And now technology is coming forward to meet us and kind of mold itself around us. I mean, even just like literally like wearables, like, (laughs) you know, that's, it's literally trying to interface with your life in a way that makes sense to you. Yeah. 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 And I, I think what's happening too is that people are reaping a lot of financial benefit, right? From making things more awesome and more usable. And, and now people are demanding it because they realize it's possible. Like I think before we might not have fully understood how possible it was. And, and I, you know, so there's a lot of proof out there and a lot of examples, um, which makes it easier going forward. Not only that, but we're, we're trained to not want change, (laughs) but, but like the latest thing is, uh, like with all the cloud services and things like we're, we are learning to adapt to change and we're more willing to try other services. And so it, we're not necessarily committed to one particular thing. And if there's something that doesn't work functionality wise in it for us, we're willing to try out something else if it has that feature. So, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And the cost of switching is becoming so low. too. Exactly. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And often the cost of entry and, and the ability to create these things has gotten a lot easier. Yeah. You know? Yes. Did you ever uh, hear the study that Microsoft did um, before they launched Office 2007? You know, when it did that big overhaul with the interface and everything became the ribbon and everything. Um, no. They had done this giant user study, like just absolutely huge. One of the biggest ones they'd ever done uh, asking what people wanted in the next office because they felt like they'd kind of mastered the technology itself. Mm-hmm. And um, 
and all of the feedback came back and the engineers and everybody's looking through it and it's 90% features that are already in Office. Just not easily accessible. Mm -hmm. Right. (sighs) Exactly. And so they ended up, that's why in 2007, Office got such a giant user interface overhaul and didn't actually add really any features. Like almost all that stuff is in Office 2003. It's just nobody knew where it was. Yeah. (laughs) That's awesome. Yeah. I feel like that that way sometimes with, uh, it's one of the things I love Android as a concept, Uh but I hate Android as an ecosystem because it's slightly different everywhere. And what what's getting exposed to the user is always like, just feels like not quite the right thing. Oh, well, we had this challenge with Cardsmith, you know, we kept it really simple, but still, you know, like, (laughs) unless you make it really obvious, people won't find stuff. And then at the the same time, you can't make everything obvious. You have to make a choice about what to make obvious and what not. Um, And there's also the sense too, like if you put stuff uh, like there, there's different needs around people that are learning to use something or someone that's not comfortable with technology versus someone that's an expert or really comfortable at picking it up. And, um, sometimes those things are mutually exclusive, not always for sure, but so it's a, it's a fine balance. And I, with Cardsmith, like we want to make it super visually clean and also super like not wordy. So like our menus are really cryptic. They're just icons. Although we do have a, a tool tips feature, but it means that it might be slightly harder to use at the beginning, depending on the type of person you are, of course. Yeah, I would totally agree. Like um, I've, I've played with Cardsmith. It's really fun. Interesting. I used it for some project management with some people. It was very fun. Um, but it is, it's definitely a, a higher entry level but at the same time, like once I got over that hump, you've got a lot of power behind Cardsmith that I don't have with some of the other apps like Trello, where it's mm-hmm. really just like, this is the only way that you can use Trello. Like, this is it. This is all we're offering. And where you guys have like, you can use it this way. But like, once you dig in, like, look at all these other ways. Mm-hmm. And so indeed, it's great, but it's a huge challenge. I will tell you from a marketing standpoint, but yeah. um, <laughs> we're taking it on bit by bit. I, yeah, I can only imagine that's a, a hell of a line to dance. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah so it was interesting that you said that it's you can't make everything like really easily accessible like not everything can be highlighted in in on the website and what's funny about that is you introduce it as like a sticky notes type you know or related to sticky notes and i had a boss that that would point out the people in in the business that i was working at and how they had a bunch of post-it notes stuck to their monitor and yeah. they're, they're there for so long that you don't see them anymore you know, yeah. like, so it's, it's like, so it's, it's bringing value, more value for those post-it notes that are just kind of getting lost. And anyways, I just thought that was an interesting. So what is your target market? We continue to, to ponder this. And, and I will be honest, like, I think we have a really clear idea of the psychographic, but uh, we're having a harder time with the demographic. But I will say this. Can I pause you there? Uh-huh. Because you are one of the first people on the show to mention those two ideas. Can you kind of differentiate what they are between there? So demographic is like kind of the hard and fast facts. Like I am a 46 year old woman, (laughs) a startup founder, entrepreneur, designer. So that's like, that's a demographic. I live in Portland. I have at this point, actually my income, I won't talk about, but you know, (laughs) so it's those kind of facts Mm -hmm. that can define a demographic segment. Uh, A psychographic segment is actually very interesting, but a little harder to target Um, but I feel like all of our people, like they have a certain mindset. Like when I look down our, uh, our list of power users and it's great, we, we use intercom actually to track this and just want to, I can't highly, I can't recommend that tool enough, but I would say they all have an entrepreneurial mindset. Um, and they are people even like there, we have someone that's an accountant, but I would say that this individual has an entrepreneurial mindset. And so it's like, they need to write their own rules. And so Cardsmith's great for that kind of mindset. Hmm. I would say they're visual, which is I would, would say is a psychographic segment uh, or a psych- psychographic um, dimension. Um, it's basically how they think, how their mind works, how they are put together emotionally. So like a type, well, would it, would type A or type B? Like I would imagine it'd be more type A, but then there are some type B people that would be... Yeah, I mean, you could probably use a whole bunch of different personality matrix to... That makes sense. I mean, that's a psychographic dimension, I would say. And and Mm. I would say that, yeah, our people are type A. I mean, our people want to make great things happen, you know, and that's where the entrepreneurial mindset 
is about and they want to do things new and different and they have an opinion about how <laughs> they want to do it. And and so that gets to another point in terms of our psychographic segmentation. Our people are process oriented and Cardsmith is great for that because you can set up your own process. Mm. It's not about Trello's process or um, there's a lot of tools around project management, but they often have a specific methodology. And so we're like, hey, you know what? You need to do the me- methodology that works for you. But that's a particular segment, right? Because there's a lot of people that just want to do some like someone else's methodology. And there's nothing like there's no judgment, you know. But I think Cardsmith is a much harder thing for them to bring on because like, how do you start with a blank page? I mean, it makes sense. It seems like, you know, you're, you've got a great open canvas that works. Like if I already have my own methodology and I'm one of those people who's like, I'm a creative and this is how I do things. Um, and I don't want to fall into the agile methodology or the lean methodology on it. Like I want to literally throw stickies at a wall and you're, you can accommodate that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I noticed that you, on your pricing, you have import from Trello. Yes. Yes, we do. So that is really cool. Can you talk about that a little bit? I think Trello is great. And, and I'm sort of thankful for it because it's a horizontal tool. And so when people go, oh, oh, you're like Trello, that's actually kind of helpful because it's hard to describe Cardsmith, even mm-hmm. if I use the sticky note metaphor. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm thankful for them. But I also feel like we have something to offer that's different, you know, and I think that there are like a lot of sort of somewhat dissatisfied Trello users. And so we want to make it easy for them to try us out. And, and what happens too, and this is, this is a hurdle for us is that people have already invested time into a particular platform. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, well, I've, I'm, I I don't love Excel, but I already have it, you know, all my information in it. So we're just trying to make it as easy as possible to cross that threshold. Mm -hmm. I mean, this was exactly what we're talking about before. It's the transition cost is so much lower. (sighs) Yeah. And that, I mean, that's great. Okay. So we've talked a ton about Cardsmith. Let's talk a little (laughs) bit about you. How did you get here? Like what, what brought you to tech? What, you know, as a creative, like why tech? It is truly an accident, but I guess a lot of things (laughs) in life are. And and I think I'm the sort of person that lets accidents happen, good and bad. (laughs) Um, and I think a lot of entrepreneurs would say that, uh, but so here's the deal. Um, Monica and I, uh, this is not our first business together. We actually co-founded a food business in 2007, I think it was, around healthy, delicious, local food made from scratch, delivered to your door. She went about four weeks into operations and realized she did not want a food business. Mm -hmm. And it took me five years to figure that out. And towards the end of my time with with Love Joy Food, that was my food business, I met up with her again. I mean, we'd been in contact because we are good friends. Um, but she was telling me about this new idea and, um, and it was based about like cards and grids and these visual systems. And I literally, I couldn't articulate why, but it stood my hairs on end. And I was like, I want to be part of that. Um, so we joined forces again and you know, it was, it's obviously a product in tech, but I don't think I chose it because it was tech. I chose it because it sounded like a really amazing problem to try to solve. So there you go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's okay. Monica's fault. No, I, <laughs> I do. I love it. It's it's really. I'm very fortunate. So Monica is uh, your technical co-founder. You would say. Uh, you know that's really funny. Neither of us are uh, technical in the sense like we don't we don't code, um, and that's challenging, right? We depend on people to code for us, and it certainly has been one of our obstacles is, is finding people, and especially when you don't understand code. But I mean, we understand a hell of a lot more now, and we know we're much wiser in terms of getting tech help. But she was more familiar with the space than I at that point, for sure. For sure. What do you think some of that wisdom is? Like, is there anything you could share that, like, oh, these are, you know, things that I would tell me yeah, a couple yeah. years ago? Or like, what, yeah, what were the hurdles well, at first, like, if you don't know, like, a whole lot about the medium, it's hard to judge if the person you're hiring knows a lot. Oh, right? sure. Yeah. So, so one of the things that Monica did was really wise is she does have friends that are very savvy, but weren't necessarily going to partner with us. Like, they had other things going on, whatever. And she would rely on them to kind of, it's kind of like 
taking your car to a car mechanic and then no taking a, a car that you're gonna buy potentially a used car to a car mechanic that you trust mm-hmm. you're like you brought them to the lemon guys <laughs> so so she would have other people kind of check our potential tech hires out and see you know are they are they what they say they're gonna be and and I think we've learned a lot too like there are some people who are so talented technically but they're not good for a startup you need someone that is like that can really get things together quickly and especially from like a high level CTO type level or development leader like they have to be able to think architecturally but also because we're so bootstrapped and we really have to get real stuff out there they they need to also understand how to implement and what the right thing to do is implement and it's um and there's so many options out there tech wise right and there's so many different philosophies so um I don't know if I've really answered your question, but like, I think that there are certain characteristics that go beyond their technical skill set that will make them a good hire or not. So we had actually one of our CTOs who, who we loved, um, we've been through a few technical folks, um, which I think is not unusual. He, he had kind of an enterprise mentality and he was very talented. He was brilliant, but he wanted to build our back end from scratch, which in the end actually didn't make sense because our point of differentiation or the value that we have to add as Cardsmith is, is our user experience and the front end stuff. So like it, in the end, we moved to doing a, um, databases service, uh, Firebase. I don't know if you're familiar with that. So we essentially pay someone to manage our back end or, a, an app, if you will. So, so we've subbed that out yeah. instead of going from scratch. No, mm-hmm. Firebase is really neat that way. I mean, I think, yeah. I think it's fascinating that like we are to the point where we can, like there's this dream in programming where everything is Legos and you can just kind of reuse things and put them back together mm-hmm. however you want. And it, and we're really kind of getting there. And services like Firebase are a good example of yeah, that. Yeah, it's, it's paying for a package dealer, like a cookie cutter, and without the expense of building your own thing that could come with a bunch of inherent problems. Indeed, indeed. Yeah. And um, we really needed to get, um, where, where we realized, realized our custom back end was failing was when we wanted to start to do real time sharing, you know, and, and as you build a software product, you know, you kind of, you can't go from awesome immediately or all the features. So you kind of have to build up. Right. And so we got to this point where we're like, okay, well, we know we need to do real time collaboration and our database, well, it was failing in other ways too. And so Firebase is awesome. That came for free with them. So that was another reason we chose them. So was was someone who you consider your CTO your first technical hire, or did you kind of do a like a prototyping round, or what did that look like? Well, there was one person we worked with a long time ago, and that just was a big fail. And that's fine, an important fail. Failing is important. It's very trendy, we know. So that was our first. And then our second was this fellow we found on Founder Dating, and he was great. This is the enterprise-oriented individual, and he was great. He got us to a place like we actually had a real product like out there that people were using and and he contributed a lot ultimately though we had another person that was working with us that i think had just the perfect mindset for what we needed and he was the one that recommended fire firebase and then we also have um someone that we brought in as an intern who is now doing most of the work and she's been amazing um but she came in through one of our people so it's it's all been through a network really Mm -hmm. It's how you find people. Well, you yep. know. Yep. Yeah, it, it is. is. That's really cool. So, I, I mean, I mean, I feel like what you said is like, it's so important. Like, you're going to fail. Like, things are going to run against you no matter what. Like, if you're being an entrepreneur, if you're trying to change careers, if you're trying to learn something new, like, I know this isn't your first rodeo, but when do you feel like you kind of, or have you gotten to the point where you started to feel comfortable or at least embrace failure as part of the process? Wow, that's a really good question. <laughs> I don't think you ever get comfortable. Like, like that would be dangerous, actually. Mm-hmm. Right? That's mm-hmm. fair. Yeah. Um, but maybe it becomes, you feel more competent <laughs> at failure, at embracing failure. And ultimately, really, it's not just about embracing failure. It's just always being open to learning, right? And, and it's a very big challenge between being really super, you have to be super focused, right? We're doing this, we're doing this, we're doing this. And then at the same time, you have to be super nimble and be like, oh my God, we can't do this anymore. You know? And so it's this incredible balance of constantly asking the question like, okay, we're doing this. Is it the right thing? Is it the right thing? You know? 
and always looking for feedback and looking for the right kind of feedback. Um, so I think I am feel a lot more competent in that process and that approach after, you know, I mean, I think really true failure is to not learn from your failures and that probably sounds really cliched, but so I think you, you just start to get wiser, <laughs> but never too wise, never wise enough. That's a good seg- segue. I want to go back to the love joy food. Um, so you, you, did you actually make the food? I did. Okay. I so did. you must've implemented some kind of website to oh, I did. accept orders. I did. So, so you weren't completely new to the whole website creation and, and management at all. Nope. No, no. Um, and it's so funny. Like back then, oh my God, like 2007, we had a store, we accepted payment, which wasn't a big deal then, but like now it's so easy, right? Yeah. So yeah, it's true. You're right. And and I'm not like non-technical. And, and I think as a designer, people are always like, oh, do you do websites? And I'm like, well, sure. You know, um, before I started Cardsmith and, you know, I used things like Squarespace and mm-hmm. things like that. And, um, and actually, I've learned a little code. I took a class in um, just to get my feet wet with CSS and HTML. And oh my god, JavaScript! Wow. Scary. <laughs> but I mean, now it's it's been really helpful actually to have that little bit of knowledge. Like, I don't think it's a good use of my time to code, but because I know how those things work and I understand the structure and what the, each of those things bring, it's really powerful and helpful for me. And then. Um, completely not tech tech related at all. I'm wondering where, how, where and how did you come up with the name Card Smith? Oh, oh, you know, I think there's always a great story around um, how people name their companies. So originally, before I was on board, they were calling it Card Stacks, and because I mean that was sort of the idea. I think that it was stacks of cards, and and that's fine, um, but it was spelled with a K. Oh. And stacks was with an X because oh. that was the, yeah no no domain, kidding domain right? right and it just oh I'm like no <laughs> I can't I can't abide I love you but I can't abide wow um, yeah and um, but that was the dot com that was available and we we're actually a dot co uh, mm-hmm. we wanted to get carsmith dot com but I think the person wouldn't take it but then we went to Gridsmith which was kind of cool but then we realized like we are not like the, the grid is not the central component of, of what we're doing. It's the card. So it's about the card. So that was fine. And then the Smith part is this idea that you build it, that it's crafted. Ah, it's, yeah. Yeah. Like a blacksmith. Yeah. 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 Mm, yeah. And interesting. So human, human component. And you know, honestly, it was really hard. I think naming a company is really, really hard. And we had name storms and we had a bunch of people over Mm-hmm. And had wine and drinks and did a facilitation around like, what should we call ourselves? And, um, that's, that's kind of what stuck. I mean, I think sometimes with naming, this sounds terrible, but like you put a lot of names up and more often than not, you end up with a list of zero that like, there's so many reasons that you can't, like a name doesn't work. It's really hard. And especially now too, because everyone wants like their .com and they're all taken. Mm -hmm. So, um, so we went with .co. I went and I ran into the same problem, not with naming, but with logo creation, you know, and sometimes the name needs to be made so that you can have a logo, you know, but, uh, I find I run a $300 logo thing on 99 designs and I don't like anything. I don't like any of it. So yeah, I am familiar with that. And then, you know, Jupiter broadcasting, the network that this podcast is on broadcasting at least says that we do something with audio, right? But Jupiter, mm-hmm. I mean, you know. Random. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, yeah. Sure, I'm sure yeah. it meant something at some point. But you, but you know, it's interesting. I think sometimes, I mean, there's so many different ways you can approach a name. Like sometimes it, ha- like we're, we're pretty literal, which is fine, but you know, like there's survey monkey and I guess the survey part is lit- like literal, but then there's the monkey. And so there's like trends around animals. And then sometimes it's yes. like, or you're like way out in left field and you're like Uber. Yeah. You know, and, and then at some point though, the brand will fill that vessel. Right. You know? And Uber has meaning now, yeah. even though at one point it didn't. It's now a verb. Sticker mule is another one. Uh-huh. Yeah. I know. I know. I know. There's a bunch. They're actually, their tagline is great. Uh, I mean, it's, it's something about, uh, I'll have to bring it up. Go ahead and I'll bring it up. Yeah. But I think at some point with a name, you just have to let the brand 
fill it out or not. You know, I mean, there are names that just suck and it should not exist. But like for a lot of names, it's just about embracing it and making it real through so many other aspects of the experience. Okay, so Sticker Mule's tagline is custom stickers that kick ass. <laughs> <laughs> that's good that's brilliant, yeah. that's brilliant. so that's brilliant. it's a whole marketing scheme <laughs> so so we actually we have a mascot and and one of the things like there was a slight insurgency at one point to call a, our company card vark oh i know i know it's kind of cool right it's kind of yeah. cute um but we decided that we instead have a mascot and he's a card vark um okay. and his name's smithy <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I love that. That's like our, the interview we did, oh man, like way back at the beginning where the com- that database company was using their mascot to like humanize their product. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, totally Annie? useful. Really? Yeah, Annie. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They're super trendy. They're super trendy, right? Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, Trello has a spokes husky. Yes, they do. Mm-hmm. He's adorable. They're actually all over the place, but you have to be careful. You, know, you don't want to overuse it because then it, it just loses value. Like, like you know, it becomes a cliche. So on your journey, like, do you feel like there have been any resources that have been super helpful to you? Like maybe books that you've read that have been good mindset changes or like networking relationships or anything like that? Oh, gosh, yes. Yes. Um, So I have to tell you, like, it's awesome being a startup in Portland um, because the community is amazing. Um, So there's a lot of meetups and like I... I did not like networking originally, but now I realize like, oh, you know what? It's, got, it's something I have to do. And, and actually it's, it's great. Um, so there's a lot of meetups. There's like the new tech PDX meetup. Gosh, I could go on. And then Monica is part of this group called X founders. So it's a specific group of female founders that meet every week. And it's the, our network and our community has been so supportive. For example, we went on product hunt. Oh gosh, let me think, De- December. And it went really well. Like I, we didn't quite make the top 10. We actually were 11th for the day, but, um, but it was still amazing. And we were successful because of our community. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, community is great too, because sometimes you just need really straight up feedback. Sometimes you just need some cheerleading. Um, I think that's probably the number one most essential thing. And I think Portland is rich. Yeah, I think startup communities all over are really starting to realize that it's that, you know, it's that personal connection that makes everything happen. And it's so interesting because like our, the vast majority of our interviews when I'm like, oh, is there something that helped you along the way? It's, it's stuff that's happening in the real world. It's, you know, we use tech, but like it's the connections we make personally, face to face or sometimes online that really kind of seal the deal. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that they provide support, but they also provide meaning, you know? and joy and it's it's so much more rewarding than i would have thought and essential so and and i think the the feeling in portland and this is so part of just essential portland culture no matter what industry you're in i feel like there's this sense of like if we help each other out like we're all going to be better like there's room for everyone to be successful it's not like oh if you're successful i won't be even in situations maybe where there's like um something we're all competing for like it there isn't this sense of like cutthroatness at all it's like hey you did awesome hey you did awesome or how can i make you more awesome that's really cool that's so awesome Mm -hmm. yeah (laughs) 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 totally well joe this has been fantastic we should wrap up now but thank you can i tell you one more book though that i absolutely adore (laughs) it's called traction by gabriel weinberg i think Kick awesome. ass. Every, yeah. every uh, software startup founder should read that book. Traction. Awesome. Yeah. Sorry. No, that's great. Yeah. No, we're always looking for good hints and tips to give out. And that's fantastic. Mm-hmm. But thank you so much for joining us and we look forward to talking to you soon. Thank you for listening to this episode of Women's Tech Radio. Remember, you can find links in our show notes at jupiterbroadcasting.com. Just locate Women's Tech Radio in the show drop down, and then you can actually listen to the back catalog as well. 
You can also use the contact form that is on jupiterbroadcasting.com. We'd love to hear what you think. You can also follow us on Twitter at HeyWTR. Catch us on iTunes, leave a review if you'd like, or email us at WTR at jupiterbroadcasting.com. Thanks for listening. <laughs>